All right, get ready for a deep dive, folks, because this one's a doozy. We're tackling a topic that's, well, let's just say it stood the test of time, the Bible. Yeah, talk about a text with a history. You got that right. And, you know, our listeners sent in a wild mix of stuff on this one, articles, excerpts, even some um, spirited Reddit threads. We've got everything from folks questioning the Bible's logic to folks who seem to think it's like the literal word of God. It's quite the spectrum, isn't it? Really speaks to the power this text still holds. Absolutely. So where do we even begin? Well, I guess the claim that Christianity holds, quote, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. It's got to be a good starting point, right? It's a bold claim, that's for sure. And it's not like this idea hasn't been challenged before. We've got some heavy hitters laying in on this one. Yeah, I mean, Richard Dawkins, he doesn't mince words. He yeah. basically called the God of the Old Testament, well, unpleasant, is putting it mildly. Right. And then there's Carl Sagan basically reminding us that the universe isn't exactly a cozy little cottage built just for us humans. <laughs> Which kind of throws a wrench into that whole made in God's image thing, huh? <laughs> so, like, how do we reconcile these very different viewpoints? Where do we even start to unpack this? Well, for me, it always comes back to context. We have to remember when and where these texts were written. The world of the Old Testament, think Bronze Age, it was a completely different reality. People were trying to make sense of a world full of mystery, you know, natural disasters, disease, war. It was terrifying. So you're saying they were just trying to explain the unexplainable. Exactly. The Old Testament emerged from a world of oral traditions, myths, evolving beliefs. It's a glimpse into how ancient people grappled with the big questions. Okay, that makes sense. But as we move through history, things change, right? Yeah. Societies evolve, beliefs shift. Right, and the Bible reflects that. As we move into the Iron Age, you see power dynamics, social structures, all of that starts to get woven into the narrative. It's a fascinating evolution. So it's more like a snapshot of their worldview at the time, not necessarily a, like historically accurate textbook. Exactly. And this is key as we move into the New Testament, because that's where things get even more, shall we say, complicated. Because now we're talking about the origins of Christianity itself, right? This is where it all began. And here's the thing, a lot of people don't realize this, but the Gospels, those stories about Jesus' life, they were written decades after the events supposedly happened. Oh, really? Decades later? Decades. Think about that. The earliest writings we have are actually letters, these epistles, dealing with, you know, very specific issues within those early Christian communities. Like, imagine trying to reconstruct a historical event based on, like, emails written decades later. Yeah, a lot can get lost or misinterpreted. Exactly. And that time gap, all those layers of interpretation, they play a huge role when we start looking at the Bible's consistency and how it measures up against, you know, historical evidence. And that's where things get really interesting. And speaking of consistency, the source bad faith really doesn't hold back. They point out some pretty, um, let's say interesting contradictions, to put it mildly, like starting with the big guy upstairs himself. Ah, yes, the classic theological dilemma. If God is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good. The whole shebang. Right. How do we square that with a world full of suffering, injustice, all the bad stuff? Yeah, it's a real head-scratcher. Yeah. And bad faith goes even further, right? They question the whole logic of sin. Like, if God designed the system and he knew humans would mess it up, isn't he kind of sort of responsible? It's a provocative argument, that's for sure. And it leads to even more, um, let's say, uncomfortable questions about the God of the Old Testament. Yeah, like all that violence, favoritism, the whole sacrifice your firstborn thing. Not exactly the image of a loving, merciful God we often think of. Not quite. And bad faith really hones in on this idea of blind faith. They argue that humans were wired to seek evidence, you know. We want proof, something tangible to base our beliefs on. Which makes sense, right? Like, we don't just accept things at face value. We want to understand why, how. Exactly. And that's where they bring up the God of the gaps argument, you know, yeah. that idea that whatever science hasn't explained yet, well, God must be responsible. Right. Like lightning bolts were divine punishment until we figured out electricity. Exactly. And their point is, as science progresses, that gap shrinks and shrinks. So what happens to faith then? That's a pretty um, unsettling thought for some people, I imagine. It can be. And it's not just the God of the gaps argument they tackle. They also bring up the whole noble lie concept. Okay, now that one's a bit of a doozy. 
Right. So the noble lie, it's this idea that maybe some religious beliefs, even if they're not literally true, they're still necessary. Necessary for what? Well, for social order, morality, you know, keeping people in line, kind of like a necessary fiction for the greater good. Hmm. So it's okay to perpetuate a myth if it like keeps people from going off the rails. That yeah. feels ethically iffy, to say the least. And bad faith agrees. They argue that manipulating people, even with good intentions, it's just not right. Transparency, honesty, that's got to come first, even if the truth is, you know, complicated. Which brings us to the million dollar question. Is the Bible itself historically reliable? Because bad faith doesn't hold back on that front either. Right. They go so far as to call it, and I'm quoting here, shockingly unreliable. They even suggest that the Gospels, those stories about Jesus's life, they might be more like folklore, you know, passed down through generations. Like a game of telephone where the story changes a little bit with each retelling. Exactly. And they highlight that those inconsistencies, they aren't just, you know, minor details. Yeah, like didn't they find different genealogies for Jesus in the Bible? Talk about an awkward family reunion. They did. The Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, they trace his lineage back in different ways. Those family trees, they don't quite match up. Yeah, that's um, that's a pretty big oversight. Mm. It makes you wonder what else might have been lost or, you know, embellished over time. But we've also got the other side of the coin here, right? We've got those Reddit threads, and they're full of people who passionately defend the Bible's accuracy. They do. And it's important to hear those perspectives, too. Some argue that the Bible's internal consistency, the way it's written, it points to divine inspiration. Others bring up archaeological discoveries that seem to line up with biblical accounts. So how do we, like, weigh these conflicting claims? It's one thing to say a text is old and open to interpretation, but we're talking about some pretty major discrepancies here. This is where textual analysis comes in. Scholars use all sorts of methods to examine the Bible, looking at authorship, sources, how it might have been edited or, you know, changed over time. Hold on. Edited. Like, censored. Well, not exactly censored. It's more about trying to understand how the text evolved. Like, are there passages that seem to contradict each other? Are there abrupt shifts in tone or style? Those can actually be clues. So we can actually use those inconsistencies to understand the Bible better. Exactly. It's like detective work, piecing together clues to get a clearer picture of the text's origins and how those origins might influence our understanding. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, so even if we acknowledge the Bible has evolved, the question remains, what about its impact on the world? And bad faith does not shy away from that debate. No, they don't. They paint a pretty bleak picture, arguing that Christianity's legacy is, well, more harmful than good. They cite everything from the Crusades to colonialism to, you know, the suppression of scientific inquiry. It's a yeah. pretty damning indictment. It is. They even quote Christopher Hitchens, who famously called the Bible the work of, and I'm paraphrasing here, crude, uncultured humans. Ouch. But what about the Redditors? They seem to have a very different take on Christianity's impact, right? They do. And it's important to remember that for billions of people, the Bible is a source of comfort, guidance, and community. It inspires acts of charity, compassion, you know. The Redditors, they highlight this side of the equation, the profound influence the Bible has had on art, music, even ethical frameworks throughout history. So which is it? A force for good or a source of harm? It feels like we're dealing with two completely opposite narratives here. It's complex, right? And I think that's why this deep dive is so important. We have to acknowledge both sides, examine the evidence, wrestle with the complexities. It's not about taking sides. It's about engaging with these questions thoughtfully and respectfully. And that's what makes this whole exploration so fascinating, mm -hmm. right? You've got bad faith offering this secular humanist perspective, urging us to ground our morality in reason, compassion. And then you have the Redditors, many of whom find deep meaning and truth in the Bible, interpreting it through their own faith and experiences. Mm -hmm. So where does that leave us? It's like we've gone down this rabbit hole and we found all this evidence, all these arguments, and they're all pulling in different directions. Right. It's almost as if the Bible itself is like a mirror. What we see in it, well, it says as much about us, but our own beliefs and experiences as it does about the text itself. That's a really interesting way to think about it. But then that raises another question, doesn't it? If we accept that there are all these different interpretations, how do we choose which one to follow? Or do we even try? That is the million dollar question, isn't it? And honestly, there's no easy answer. The source, bad faith, they'd probably say we need a healthy dose of skepticism, you know? They want us to ground our values in reason, compassion, our shared human experience, not just blindly follow a text that was written centuries ago. 
Makes sense. I mean, the world has changed a lot since then, right? We know more now than we did back then. Exactly. But then, you know, you have the Redditors, and many of them would say that the Bible's power comes from its ability to, like, transcend time. That even if some parts seem outdated, the core message, that message of love, hope, redemption, it still resonates. So it's like this paradox. The Bible can inspire incredible faith, deep skepticism, sometimes even both at the same time. Exactly. And that's the beauty of this deep dive, I think. We didn't come here to tell you what to believe, but we've hopefully given you some new ways to think about these questions. I like that. We're not declaring a winner in this debate, right? It's about acknowledging <laughs> the complexity, the history, and yeah, the impact this book continues to have. It's about asking those tough questions. And honestly, the answers might surprise you. What matters is that we keep searching, keep learning, keep the conversation going. Couldn't have said it better myself. Yeah. So to all our listeners out there, we want to hear from you. What resonated with you? What new insights were you taking away? Because this conversation, well, it doesn't end here. If anything, it's just the beginning.